Welcome to a special edition of Context. A communicable disease has brought the world to its knees, people and countries in lockdown. A never before experienced event in modern times. COVID-19 has changed the world and cases are still on the rise in Canada. Prime Minister Trudeau announcing the unprecedented closing of the US-Canada border to all non-essential travel and an $82 billion COVID-19 response package. Today on Context, advice for how to live through this. We bring you interviews from people on the front lines about how best to manage during this crisis. But first, good information is critical for battling the coronavirus. And I want to thank our donors because every minute of Context is paid for by you because you support good journalism and a clear understanding of God's providence in our world. So today we bring you the stories and information that you need to know during the COVID-19 crisis. Dr. Allison McGeer is an infectious disease specialist from Mount Sinai. She is on special assignment to research COVID-19. Dr. McGeer, thank you for taking time to speak with our audience again. Pleasure to talk to you always. You are a veteran at this. You contracted SARS in 2003 when it infected 375 Canadians. Now, though, we have something even more contagious. How much worse are you expecting COVID-19 to get in Canada? So I think, you know, what we're talking about at the moment is that we cannot stop the spread of this infection because we can't stop it we can expect over the next period of time and that that may maybe shorter or longer depending on our actions that quite a large fraction of canadians are going to catch it we're trying to delay it now for two reasons the first is that the further we get into it the more work we do the greater the chance is that we'll find drugs that can treat it drugs that can prevent it if you've been exposed, vaccines, um, so that we'll be able to protect people better, either prevent them from getting infected or reduce the burden if they do get infected. Um, so that's one thing. And then the second thing is that we know that if we just allow this to continue to spread the way it would normally, um, that we're going to have a very large number of sick people very quickly, um, and that's going to overwhelm our healthcare system system and then we will not be able to take care of those patients adequately and we may not be able to take care of other patients in the system adequately okay. so it, it, the goal is not so much to reduce the total number of infections as it is to spread it out over time okay so testing for covid is limited to travelers with symptoms and high-risk people is that adequate right now well, it's what we have right now. So I, I think we'd all like more testing. Um, but the problem, of course, is this is a pandemic. So everywhere around the world, everybody is trying to do a lot of testing. Um, and it's it, it, for, to do that testing, you need supplies. You need the nose swabs. You need all the bits and pieces of laboratory equipment. You need the people who are trained to do it. Um, and and everybody's scrambling to to try to share things globally, okay? So we all want to be able to do essential testing around the world and, and across Canada, labs are shipping swabs back and forth and equipment back and forth and, and moving things around to try to get as much as we can. Um, so it, it's not that we don't want to do more testing, it's that just at the moment, uh, globally, we can't do all the testing we want to do. So we're trying to make sure that we focus it in the areas that are really important. But there will be more, for sure, there will be more testing available as we as we get further through this. Okay, wash our hands, self-isolate, social distancing, closing schools, businesses, recreational facilities, sports venues, basically everything. Um, the virus is still out there. What's next in our behavior to curb this? So the, the goal now is to, to, to really slow down the transmission dramatically. So you know, once it starts, you want to say, okay, we're doing everything now. And, and of course, it's not quite everything because what we're doing is maintaining essential services, trying to keep as much as we can going. So what public health has decided to do is to say, we're going to create as much social distancing as we possibly can 
um, for the next two weeks. Once we get the transmission slowed down under control, then we're going to sit down and say, okay, what can we release? What additional things can we do that we think are safe? And I think there's going to be a period of time after our two weeks when we're talking about, okay, we, we can we can do these things, but not these things. Um, we can, you know. And, and doctor, there are still people working. Okay, we've got banks, we've got construction workers, frontline medical workers required to work through this. Is it easy to catch this virus if all those protocols are being followed? Oh, yeah, so, so, so we know that we can slow down transmission of this virus. The, the, there are a lot of questions about how much we have to do to slow it down. Um, we, we can't stop it, but we can dramatically slow it down, and that's been demonstrated in Singapore and in Taiwan uh, and in, uh, in South Korea, um, who had a bigger outbreak, but now have it slowed down. So, so we know we can slow it down. We're just talking about how much we have to do to get it to slow down and, and how slow we need to have it um, in order to be able to continue to deliver care and to take the best care of people who get sick. Okay, so now let's talk about the food supply. Uh, grocers still assuring us that there's lots of food in the supply chain. Restaurants are closed, but we are being told we can order and take out, but not uh, gather together, of course. What about the food preparation delivery services? Uh, what about food prep and coronavirus? Can we safely order food for pickup and takeout? Yes, I, to, to my mind, we can definitely safely order food for pickup and takeout. Um, uh, certainly the food is safe, um, uh, but remember that y y the majority of people are not ill. Every everything about this is about assessing risk. We can't get the risk to zero but we can get the risk low enough. And there's there's two pieces um, uh, that you know protect you with takeout food or, or pick up food. The first is the transmission of this virus through fomites, okay, on um, services equipment is not very efficient. The most efficient way that this virus is transmitted is directly from one person to the next person. So me standing beside you, me touching you, me breathing or coughing on you. Okay. So transmission, well, might not as good. The second thing is, of course, you can always clean your hands, right? So you pick up food, you take it out of its containers, you put the container in the garbage, you clean your hands before you eat it. Your mother told you always to clean your hands before you ate, and that is what we should all be doing. All right. Dr. McGeer, you uh, have had your own job change. You are on special assignment now to research COVID. Uh, you know, we have a faith-filled audience. We're a faith-filled broadcast team. We're gonna pray that your work is successful and that uh, researchers like yourself get to the next steps needed to combat this disease. And, and I thank you very much for that. I, this is um, at, at the moment for those people who are ill, a, a, a difficult and, and for many people and families, a tragic illness. Um, and, and like you, I am both working hard and, um, and really hoping that we will be able to deliver better treatments, better prevention, vaccine um, uh, mechanisms so that people don't have to continue suffering with this. All right. Infectious disease specialist, Dr. Allison McGeer from Toronto's Mount Sinai. Thank you for joining us again. Nice to talk to you. Take care. Bye-bye then. The COVID-19 outbreak began in Wuhan, China's wet markets. Millions of people quarantined in that city. We spoke with a Canadian who was living in Wuhan when the virus first struck. Wayne Duplessis told Context at the time that he and his family would not return to Canada, but his plans then changed. He spoke with Context producer Christine Yu. Take a look. Take us back to the beginning of how it all began. Uh, it was just just before Christmas, I guess, that we were told that there was, uh, there was something in, in Wuhan. Uh, we knew that people were getting sick, and all we knew at that point was that it had come from the market. That was about six kilometers from the house. Um, but more than that, we didn't know. It's cold and flu season. Everyone's going to get coughs. So we went to the doctor. Uh, and, of course, we were worried. 
uh, now because there were more cases. Uh, and the doctor said, uh, no, it's nothing to worry about. Emily had a sore throat and White had a sore throat and I had a bit of a, a cough then. And then the next day, Wuhan is shut down and the smell of bleach was really, really strong. Uh, in the pharmacy, and this is the first time I'd seen this, the, the workers, uh, you know, whether they be pharmacists or whatever, were wearing hazmat suits. That's terrifying to see at any time. So the preparations were getting more intense. They had the self-checkout uh, lines, but they were using them in a different way, so people weren't touching them. And what's it like in Wuhan now from what you've been hearing? It's getting better. Uh, because the rate of infections are, are down uh, significantly. Uh, you had mentioned the last time we spoke that you were not going to be leaving Wuhan. What made you decide to come back? The, it was largely because we couldn't get uh, food and water. Adrian had been trapped on, our oldest son, had been trapped on the other side of, uh, of Wuhan and his, he was only getting food uh, when he could, and he was, you know, and it wasn't, you know, it was noodles and it was whatever was available. Adrian actually got flagged for having high temperature. You told me that your son collapsed when you came into Canada. Yeah. What happened? Uh, he had eaten a little, then he collapsed. The medics were there. They put him on a stretcher. They put leads on him, and the first thing, of course, they were checking for symptoms mm -hmm. that it was malnutrition and that it was dehydration. The dehydration, the malnutrition, I mean, it seems like he just got back to Canada in the nick of time. Yeah. How does that make you feel? Uh, incredibly grateful. Um, yeah, uh, you know, Canada and everyone really came through for us, so right. it's, wow. it's hard not to, uh, you know, count your blessings and definitely, definitely it's, uh, not to overplay it, but it is, it is your faith realized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you said that this experience has confirmed your faith. Very in, much In so. what way, if you can describe? Well, us. I've always seen the patterns, but um, I'm naturally skeptical. Part of what I do, part of who I am, I'm naturally skeptical. And I don't think that will change. Um, but this has, this has really, you know, given me a physical manifestation of, of faith. To get on the bus, you know, after 14 days of being masks, masked for everything, you know, every interaction, either through the door or being masked, and then to literally just take your mask off, wash your hands, and someone says, okay, you can take off your mask, you don't have to put a new one on, that's freedom. The last viral pandemic to hit the world was H1N1 in 2009. 428 Canadians died from that outbreak, including Perry Cherneski, a Manitoba pastor hospitalized just after preaching his Father's Day sermon. His widow, Claudia, joins us now from Edmonton. Claudia, what is going through your mind now as you watch another pandemic? Well, Lorna, the first thing that comes to mind is that uh, my heart goes out to all of those people. I saw a documentary on the CBC about the pandemic in China and how many people were affected and how horrible it was. And I was just praying for the Chinese people. Such sorrow and suffering, and it's difficult. It's a very difficult time and it raises a lot of fears. Yeah, you know, I, I uh, think back to our first visit 11 years ago, when after yes. a busy weekend with weddings and a Father's Day sermon, Perry could no longer ignore his worsening symptoms and Claudia, you had to rush him to hospital. We've all done it, pushed ourselves through sickness. That's what Perry did to get all that work done. Um, how do you feel now as you look back at that, you look at our world today, any advice? Well, Lorna, I don't see how Perry and I could have done anything differently because the symptoms were gradual in the beginning. He started developing a cough, and it was only when we went to the hospital that he actually started coughing blood that we realized it was something more serious. Um, so for people, you don't want to panic. The worst thing to do is to panic, I think, to begin with. Um, if you've got a cough, there's still lots of colds and stuff, lots of viral stuff going around, is just to stay home. 
um, you may actually make things worse by going to the hospital early would be, is my thinking, you know? And your uh, faith, Perry's faith, you guys yes. locked on. We've, we've put the full uh, testimony that you gave uh, up on our Context website. A beautiful hope that you have in heaven that Perry was going to a better place. How has yes. it um, how have, has your faith carried you through knowing God connects with us? Well, I was talking just briefly to you about Psalm 56. And for Christians, and this is something I do for myself too, I try to find hope in Scripture. And Psalm 56 says, When I am, I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, and I am not afraid. But then later in the psalm, it goes back and it says, Record my misery, list my tears on your scrolls. Are they not in your record? What's carried me through all this time, through being a widow, being a single mom, losing my job, having different difficulties, is the fact that that God is personal and he cares and he has a plan and you have to take it day by day. Put your trust every day in God and not in circumstances. Claudia, I, I wanna thank you for modeling to us what it is like to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, you spoke of it as you faced the first pandemic and as you yeah. mentioned, all the hardships since and now in your widowhood and today, your full interview from that early journey is up on our website. Uh, Claudia, thank you for the gift of Psalm 56 and being with us today. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you. Houston, no abnormalities. We've docked safely. Everything appears to be good to go. My God, it's beautiful. I wish you could see this. Everyone should get a chance to see something like this. Well, people in poverty are especially hard hit from the hardships of COVID-19, but for the 35,000 Canadians that are homeless on any given night in this country, it's a very difficult road. Aaron Oxford is the executive director of the Dale Ministries. They create food care for Toronto's homeless people. Aaron, what are people who are living in homelessness going through with all this social distancing and self-isolation? It's a very difficult and unique time for people. I think a lot of those who um, are underhoused right now are um, generally uh, very keenly aware really of of this like the social distance that they feel generally I guess is what I want to say and now it's been made even more acute um, there are very few places that are available for people to um, rest in so sort of drop-in centers that would typically be open have had to close um, and now on top of that so many de facto uh, drop-in spaces are closed as well, things like libraries and community centers. And so there is a fair amount of tension, I would say, that exists on the street right now. People very concerned about where they will find their next meal. They were already concerned about that, but now this heightens that and um, also just where to go. Okay. Erin, your job is to hand out food. How has your food delivery changed for them? Your food community you used to bring people indoors. It's not happening like that anymore, is it? No, it's not. So we, yeah, one of the primary ways we gather is around a table. And so, of course, we can't do that right now, sharing large platters of food. Um, so we have had to move to uh, creating boxed or bagged uh, lunches and breakfasts um, that we're handing out at the door currently. On Monday, we were able to do an outdoor um, barbecue where we were handing people safely um, hot dogs that we had to be consumed outdoors and on their own. Uh, but it has really meant that we've had to modify our programming 
uh, significantly. Okay. How can Canadians help? Uh, charities like yours for the homeless, uh, there's a charity crisis going in across the country, but for this most dire area of need, feeding, giving people mm -hmm. a place to sleep, what, what needs to be done? What can we do? Well, I think that uh, people who are self-isolating at home <laughs> um, or just social distancing, that there are still ways to uh, support this community. And one of the ways is through money. Uh, so if you can donate uh, directly to an organization um, such as the Dale or any of the other ones across this country, uh, food banks are being particularly hard hit. So if you are somebody that's been in a position to uh, really stockpile things, uh, making sure that you don't um, have so much that it means other people don't have access to any. And I uh, so sharing food, uh, sharing money, um, those are the two biggest things I would say right now. All right, Erin Oxford, very good ideas. Get to that food bank, help out uh, with a donation. Get to that charity, click online for the Homeless Ministries, give a donation. Aaron Oxford, Executive Director at the Dale Ministries in Toronto, thank you. Thank you, Lorna. I really appreci appreciate the opportunity to share this. Well, a challenge for all of us in these times of pandemic, how do we stop the spread of coronavirus while still staying positive in isolation? Andy Crouch is the author of Culture Making. And Andy, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to get to talk with you again. Okay. We are told self-isolate, maintain social distancing. Every business is closing their doors where we used to socialize. We've got another two weeks at least of that. What impact does that have on community? It's going to be a very serious impact, uh, not so much in the first few days, but in the longer term. Uh, for a few days, we can survive almost anything, and we've all experienced that with snow days and so forth. Uh, but this is probably not a blizzard. Uh, it's more like winter, and how we're going to find ways to stay connected to each other uh, past, actually, the next few days or the next few weeks is one of the most important questions for us to be thinking about. Okay, what kind of ideas are you coming up with? How do we maintain community through extended social isolation? Well, I would say, in a way, go as high bandwidth as you can. That is, the more you can see and hear of other people, the better. Wow. Uh, text messages are very low bandwidth. Video chat, like we're able to do right now, is high bandwidth. Of course, being in person is the best, but that's only going to be possible in some places uh, with the permission of local authorities for small groups of people. And so beyond that, I think thinking about how do I actually hear uh, the voice of friends and family? How do I see them? Uh, that actually makes a huge difference. We're, we're made most of all to see each other's faces, to interact face to face. And very fortunately uh, for the present, we have access to technologies, many of us that allow us to do that. So the more you can have real deep personal inter interaction and the less time you're spending just reading or texting, uh, the, the more you'll actually feel connected and genuinely be connected to other people. Okay, so ramp it up. <laughs> Your face chats, <laughs> all of those kinds of things, ramp it up. Okay, um, it, it works well for younger people. How is this gonna work for cross-generational stuff? Uh, some seniors, I mean, even for getting ready for today, I had to have somebody 20 years younger than myself tell me, <laughs> do this, don't do that, get this FaceTime going, don't worry about a Zoom. How are we going to help I, the old people? Well, uh, some of these technologies uh, can be initially confusing. I think many folks can learn them fairly quickly, and we will have to talk perhaps relatives who haven't used it before through it. I just have set my own parents who are in their late 70s up on Zoom, and I will tell you, uh, we've always just done phone calls before, but uh, in this time, we're separated by about a five hours drive and it's not feasible to visit them uh, right now. Uh, it's so helpful for both sides to see one another's faces. So uh, it's time for younger generation to play tech support, which they've been doing for quite a while. <laughs> and uh, the good news is technology, uh, part of what technology does is make things pretty easy. And, and as tech gets higher tech, it gets easier to use. and. It's definitely possible, I think, for most folks uh, to learn to use these systems to communicate with each other. Okay, and I'm, uh, I'm feeling that there is something in the silence. How much silence and how do I activate the silence well for my spiritual health? 
Wow. Yes, a lot of us are dealing with a lot more quiet and a lot more options about what to, what to do with our time than we've ever had. Some people, of course, are are completely overwhelmed, whether it's because they work in medical fields or have essential jobs. But uh, for a lot of us, <laughs> there's a new kind of quiet. And I find it's best to have rhythms in my day. I have some periods of the day where I'm not on screens, I'm not checking news, I'm not even communicating directly with other people, uh, going outside to the extent you can makes a huge difference to be out in uh, in creation as a creature mm. uh, and take it in small doses. Uh, doesn't hurt to turn on some music as well after you've had some silence. Because there's some anxiety management that's absolutely significant here. Too much media, too much unnatural sources. Uh, what's your best take for anti-anxiety in this time? I think... Uh, rhythms really help having a structure for the day. So I myself, uh, a number of years ago, started uh, every day, beginning my day by going outdoors before I look at any screen. And that was when my screens were delivering a lot less anxiety producing things than they do uh, these days. And it's such a good way to begin the day, uh, beginning and ending the day with prayer. Um, Actually, beginning each time of prayer with just a few moments of breathing. Uh, there's nothing magical about this. Uh, there's nothing specific to any particular religious tradition about it. But it's just uh, allowing myself to be who I am, where I am, uh, and then connection with other people and telling the stories of what you're experiencing to other people makes a big difference. Uh, but having some structure where you plan that you're going to pause at different moments uh, can really help. All right. Well, Andy Crouch, you are the author of Culture Making. You've got a busy little family of your own to manage and uh, quite a community there. Thank you for encouraging us to uh, keep present with each other in new ways during our isolation. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, then. Our final word is on self-care. As you self-isolate for COVID-19, use the changes in your activity to go into your spirit. Renew your spirit with God and be filled again with patience, kindness, goodness. We need those for those closest to us and those needing encouragement. It's really easy to infect people with our own nasty behavior and also our good behavior. So it will take some soul centering time to have personalities and reactions filled with God's qualities we find on the pages of the Bible. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. So read the good book, let it fill you. I've left some great scriptures in my blog this week on that, and we have no choice but to pray for it and to ask God to put the divine good nature in our own. More on our website at Context Beyond the Headlines. And join us on Facebook for a chat and stream and share the show anytime at intothecastle.com. For all of us at Context, I'm Lorna Duick. That was our full show that's posted every Thursday on YouTube. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell to get our weekly episodes and web exclusives.